Mahaba, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Doc Is In, where Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi's expert physicians and dedicated caregivers converge to explore the dynamic intersection of technology, compassionate care, and research to help deliver the best patient outcomes. Join us as we delve into a transformative advancements that shape the forefront of healthcare, sparking conversations that bridge innovation with patient-centered excellence. From the latest healthcare innovations to the latest surgical procedures and technologies, we'll cover it all. So whether you're a medical professional, science enthusiast, clinician, or just an avid podcast listener looking to expand your horizons, this podcast is for you. My name is Prudence Marshall, and I will be your host for today's episode brought to you by the Fatima Bint Mubarak Center at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Before we dive in, remember to hit like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications button as we're here to make the doc is in your number one destination for healthcare podcasts. So whether you're about to buckle up for a drive, get ready for a run or warm up a cup of coffee, join us now as the doc is in. Here for today's episode is Dr. Stephanie Ritchie. Dr. Stephanie Ritchie is a fellowship trained surgical oncologist at our Fatima Bin Mubarak Center here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Dr. Ritchie received her medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in the US, where she also completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology. Following her residency, Dr. Ritchie completed a fellowship in gynecologic oncology at John Hopkins University in the United States. Throughout her career, Dr. Ritchie has specialized in gynecological oncology, completing over 3,000 operations from minimally invasive surgery to cytoreductive surgeries with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Her research interests have focused on mainly clinical patient care with rare uterine tumors, our time to treatment and survivorship for gynecological cancer survivors. Welcome to the Doc is In, Dr. Ritchie. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So today I am looking forward to you sharing with me and our community about cervical cancer. So before we dive in, I loved reading your blurb, hearing that you're a surgical oncologist. Could you just tell myself and the listeners, what is a surgical oncologist and how does that impact cancer care here at the Fatima Bin Mubarak Center? Yeah, so basically, you know, like myself, I'm a gynecologic oncologist and then we have surgical oncologists who specialize in other, other fields, right? Colorectal cancer, um, you know, peritoneal cancers. And basically what a surgical oncologist is, is someone who's completed a fellowship um, specific to oncologic surgical training, meaning they have done extra extra years, extra training. For me, it was three extra years of training specifically for uh, cancer surgery. Um, and that allows us to do things like you, you mentioned high PEC, heated interperitoneal chemotherapy, um, but also, you know, cytoreductive surgeries, meaning surgeries where we remove all of the cancer that we can visibly see. Uh, things like surgical staging, where we take lymph nodes and biopsies of, you know, to, to properly stage a cancer. And so all of that specialty training um, is part of a surgical oncology fellowship. And so at Fatima bin Mubarak, we have um, surgeons in multiple different specialties of uh, different cancer specialties um, who are specifically trained to treat those patients surgically. That sounds amazing. And thank you for all those extra years. I know that our patients here will be incredibly grateful for that. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about cervical cancer today, and we're going to kind of work through this bit by bit and help our listeners understand what we are. I think our first question that we have for us today is, what does cervical cancer look like for someone that might be listening? Uh, so, so cervical cancer usually presents um, with some sort of um, abnormal bleeding. Um, and so that can be bleeding in between a period or uh, bleeding after sexual intercourse uh, which in neither of those scenarios is normal. So if a woman has any of those symptoms, she should be evaluated. Um, but that's generally uh, how cervical cancer presents, how a woman kind of figures out that she might have it okay. um, if it's not caught on screening, which we're also going to talk about today. Okay, yeah, and that, that leads us into this. So if a woman has these or is suspicious of cervical cancer, what does cervical cancer screening look like? What does the procedure involve? Yeah, so basically the cervical cancer is screened for using something called a pap smear and an HPV test. Um, a pap smear is uh, basically a scraping of the cells from the cervix and um, a cytologist, which is a special specialized uh, doctor who looks at, at cells and tells us if they look normal or abnormal, um, looks at the pap smear, looks at the cells from the cervix, 
and tells us if it looks like normal cervical cells or they look like they might be precancerous cells or they might be cancerous cells. Um, and that's the what people refer to as the smear portion of the, of the pap smear, okay? The second part of a pap smear is something called an HPV test where we test for the HPV virus. And the reason why we test for the HPV virus is because we know that more than 90% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV, strains of HPV. There are many, many different strains of HPV, but there are certain ones that we know are high risk and cause and can cause cervical cancer if it goes untreated. So if someone's pap smear test came back abnormal, mm -hmm. the smear test came back abnormal, what would that look like? What would those next steps be? So it depends on uh, what the result is, but most abnormal results, whether they have changes that we consider to be low grade changes, meaning the changes are small, or they could have something called high grade changes, which means there's a lot of changes in the cells, um, or they could just, they could have a normal, they could have normal cells, but be HPV positive. Um, and so if that's, in most of those scenarios, the next step is going to be something called a colposcopy. So the pap smear is a screening test. The colposcopy is a diagnostic test, meaning that if you've screened positive, meaning you have an abnormal result on your pap smear, then we want to do something to either confirm or deny that you may have an abnormality in the cervix. Um, and it doesn't mean you have cervical cancer just because you have an abnormal pap smear. It, your colposcopy could be completely normal, or you could have some low-grade changes, meaning you have some precancerous cells that we have to watch, but not necessarily have to do anything about. We're just, we just know that they're there and we have to watch them. The interesting thing about cervical cancer and precancerous uh, cervical cancer cells is that it's all immune related. So because it's caused by the HPV virus, our own immune system is able to get rid of a lot of the changes caused by the HPV virus, especially when they're low grade changes, meaning they're just they're just changed, the cells are a little bit abnormal. They're not very abnormal. Um, and so sometimes just, you know, watching and waiting and continuing to test, uh, these um, precancerous cells will get, you know, will go away on their own. But if there are, you know, a lot of changes in the cells, they're very abnormal, um, then usually we will we'll need to do something more to remove them um, to make sure they don't progress into a cancer. Thank you. And I think that's such a great distinction for our listeners to know that an abnormal cervical screening test doesn't necessarily indicate mm -hmm. that the patient may have cervical cancer. And there are steps that you would need to go through and having a specialist like yourself can help them navigate that. So that's really important. You mentioned about HPV or the human papillomavirus. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about this and my understanding about the vaccine that we yep. can have for HPV? Yeah. So, uh, you know, First, I want to, there's a lot of stigma around being tested positive for HPV. Um, and a lot of patients that I see who have HPV, um, you know, they, they worry about it. They worry about having to tell their partner that they have it. And I just want women to know that all sexually active adults have HPV in some form or another. There are high risk strains and low risk strains. And we all get it just through sexual activity. There's nothing bad about it. Um, we just, we test for it because we know it can cause cervical cancer. That's the only reason why we even know you have it because it's, it's an asymptomatic virus. Men are asymptomatic from it. They don't know they have it and they don't know that they're transmitting it to their partner. Um, and it's the same thing for women, but women find out that they have it because we test for it on a, on a, a pap smear. on a pap smear. Um, so I just want, you know, women to know that, that there's nothing to be ashamed about having the HPV virus because it's just a part of adult life, human life. Um, the second thing is, so the HPV virus, as I mentioned before, there are high risk strains and low risk strains. The, and we will test for both when we test for the HPV um, virus. Um, if you have a low risk strain, we don't really worry about that too much, but obviously if you have a high risk strain, we're gonna be watching you more closely. We might be due to something like a colposcopy. The other thing to know about HPV is that once you have it, you have it forever. And it's, so it's not something that you can take a medication for to get rid of. You can do things to help your body fight it off, meaning you know, your immune system can cause the HPV virus to uh, remain dormant um, in your body and not be active, not be changing cells in the cervix from normal to abnormal. 
Um, and those things are getting vaccinated against the HPV virus. Um, and the other thing is just keeping a healthy lifestyle to keep your immune system you know, going. So that means regular exercise, you know, walking 30 minutes a day kind of thing, um, and eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, so those things will help your immune system um, remain strong. That's it's really valuable, and it's, it's wonderful to always touch on reasons that patients may feel sensitive or concerned to, to come in and have cervical screening done. So thank mm -hmm. you for elaborating on that. Um, for screening, what age should our listeners think about starting their screening? Mm -hmm. And then could you talk us through how often that occurs or what the periodic risk is there? Yeah, yeah. So um, in the United States, we start screening at the age of 21 um, because we assume that by the age of 21, most women are sexually active. Um, however, really, you need to start screening once you become sexually active. So if you become sexually active later than 21, you can you can start screening at that time. Uh, once you start screening, generally in the 20s, we don't tend to test for the HPV virus because we know that everyone is going to have it. Um, and so in the, in a, for a woman in her 20s, you know, she might get a pap smear if it's normal every three years, if it's abnormal more frequently than that. Okay. Once a woman um, is 30 or above, we, t we then test for the HPV virus. Okay? okay, so we do a pap smear and we test for the HPV virus. If you are negative, uh, if you have a negative pap smear and, and are negative for the HPV virus, then you can go five years without another screening test. Yeah. Um, um, and if you, if you only have a pap smear but you don't have an HPV test, you can go three years with a negative, with a negative test. Um, and again, if you, but if you have an abnormal, then screening is going to become more frequent. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Um, as far as the getting vaccinated against the HPV virus, which obviously helps your HPV be negative, um, the uh, vaccination is usually recommended between the ages of 9 and 12. And I believe that um, here in the UAE, it's being offered in the school system, which is excellent. Um, the, uh, but however, it is actually FDA approved for women up to the age of 45. Um, and so we offer it up until that time. So if I see a woman who has not been vaccinated, but she has a high-risk HPV strain or has precancerous cells in her cervix, I will offer her the vaccination because there is um, some really good data to show that women who, you know, who are in their 30s and 40s who develop something called um, CIN2, which is a precancerous lesion, um, if, they, if you, that lesion is treated, meaning removed, surgically removed, and then you give them the vaccine, that they will have a reduction of 60 to 70 percent chance of ever getting those precancerous cells back. Um, so it's so again, I vaccinate everyone that I see who who has HPV. And that's such a great thing to know about healthcare that as we get these innovations and as we get our additional data, even if you weren't in the schooling system at that time or mm -hmm. you weren't there to get that vaccine, it's definitely something you can get throughout your healthcare journey yeah. here at Cleveland Clinic and Absolutely. with physicians such as yourself. To kind of close up this, so it's great we've talked about screening, so you know when you can get screened. Uh, we've discussed what that journey would look like for you. We've discussed the HPV virus and vaccination. Is there anything else that you feel that our listeners would benefit from knowing about cervical cancer and cervical cancer screening? Just to do it. <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of women who come to me and you know, they're worried because they haven't done their any cervical cancer screening up until that point in their lives and um, because they were too afraid. Yeah. There's nothing to be afraid of. This is just a screening test. It's the yeah. same thing as getting a colonoscopy or your mammogram or, you yeah. know, it's, it's really just a routine part of keeping yourself healthy because if we can find something at the precancerous stage, it's so much easier to treat. Or even if it's, you know, an early stage cancer, it's so much easier to treat than a later stage cancer. Stage three and stage four cervical cancer is um, almost always a terminal diagnosis. Um, our treatment is, is good and we're able to get it under control for a period of time, but we're not able to cure those people. Um, so please just go for your screening. It's really, really important. So it definitely sounds like cervical cancer awareness and screening is really about prevention yes, and absolutely. that preventative medicine is key. 
Um, thank you so much for being with us here today. I know that I've learnt so much from our conversation. Um, for those listening, if you enjoyed what you learnt today about cervical cancer and cervical cancer screening and you would like to book an expert consultation with Dr Ritchie here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in the Fatima bin Ubarak Centre, please you can go to clevelandclinicabudabi.ae or you'll find the direct link in our episode description. Thank you again for being with us here today and we really look forward to joining us on the next episode of The Doc Is In.